for the latest um, in the School of Architecture's International Lecture Series. Um, I feel really privileged to have been asked to introduce tonight's speaker, who is Natasha Jen, partly because I'm a big fan of her work um, and partly because I understand that tonight she's going to show us uh, a little bit of very recent work uh, for a company called Magic Leap. Um, if you've never heard of them, they're one of the most speculated about um, and perhaps most secretive uh, tech companies in the world. Uh, so just to provide you a bit of background on our speaker, uh, Natasha is an award-winning designer, educator and a partner at Pentagram. Um, you're probably all familiar with the work of Pentagram, uh, but for those who aren't, uh, they're the world's largest uh, independent design consultancy and they have offices in London, New York, San Francisco, Berlin and Austin. Uh, their work covers everything from architecture and interiors to books, branding and identities, digital installations, exhibitions, films, products and websites. Uh, Natasha was born in Taipei in Taiwan and studied graphic design at the School of Visual Arts in New York. Uh, in 2010, she established her own studio, NGen Works, before being invited to join Pentagram's New York office in 2012. Her work encompasses brand identities, environmental design, multi-scaled exhibitions, signage systems, print, motion and interactive graphics, and she's worked for the likes of uh, the Guggenheim Museum, OMA, Rex, uh, MIT Architecture, and the Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York. Uh, in 2014, she was acclaimed by Wired magazine as one of the n nine designers who matter. Uh, her recent projects include Border City, uh, which I think some of you probably saw this year at um, the inaugural uh, London Architecture Biennale, um, and this was a, a kind of speculative conceptual proposal for a truly binational city between the US and Mexico, um, a sort of alternative to Trump's uh, proposal for a wall. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, following the talk, uh, we'll have a, a Q&A, uh, and Beth Hughes, uh, the head of architecture at the RCA, is going to join us on stage. Um, but for now, uh, please welcome Tasha Jen. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah? Cool. Um, so first of all, um, I'm, I'm very happy um, to be here. This is my first time um, at RCA, and this is a really great um, auditorium. So um, I'm, I'm going to um, give you, first of all, a little bit of um, information and background about um, what I do. Um, I'm a graphic designer. Um, I'm not an architect, but I happen to uh, work with a lot of architects ac across different types of um, projects. Um, I am a partner um, at Pentagram. So um, I think many of, many of you may have heard of um, Pentagram. We are a um, interdisciplinary um, design company. Um, started 43 years ago, actually, um, in London. Um, I'm based in New York City, and this is uh, a, an overview um, of our happy uh, partners. Um, right now, we have 21 um, partners globally. Um, we still kind of operate, you know, um, in, in a kind of very intimate um, way. Um, in, in a way, uh, it, it's not that different from, say, like a family um, business, but what kind of characterizes um, Pentagram and what makes Pentagram very different from other design agencies is the way that um, we, 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 we go about design. So here you see that there, um, there are about four generations um, of partners, you know, all working under one umbrella. Um, but each partner um, is a kind of autonomous creative and business entity. So in a way, when you think about Pentagram, it's not necessarily um, an organization that has a kind of typical structural um, setup, but rather it's a, it's a cloud, you know, it's an umbrella, um, and it's a design um, collective. I joined Pentagram um, in 2012, and this was one of the uh, first things that, that I did, um, this was for um, a series of three posters um, that, um, that coincides with Pentagram's 40th um, anniversary. So here what I was trying to do is that, um, is to look at the, um, the body of work, you know, the breadth of work um, of the company. It was a way for me to kind of understand it, but also a way for me to kind of reimagine 
um, the, this, this, this really long history of work in a kind of totally different new way. So we created this kind of imaginative um, urban scape um, in which everything is actually made up with um, a pentagram um, project. So um, it started out um, from the 70s all the way to the 90s. I didn't actually get to do um, the 2000, which is something that I think I should do um, right now. So. Um, I have my own um, team at, at Pentagram. Um, our team size is pretty small. Um, it ranges from 10 to um, 16 um, people. Still a pretty, you know, um, manageable uh, size. So um, our the, the fabric of our work is actually pretty messy, you know, in a way that it deals with um, not necessarily specific um, media or genre or, you know, um, topics, but rather it deals with um, the very nature of um, identity. So here um, is a quick overview of the identity and exhibition and publication and swag design for um, Office US, which was the um, Amer American um, Biennale at the 2014 Venice um, Architecture, uh, American Pavilion for the um, 2014 Venice Biennale of Architecture. And then um, what we do also um, is, is, is um, typography um, design. So when we, when we uh, design an identity project, sometimes you know, it's an identity that has very specific, uh, say, applications, you know, such as um, video, film, or website, or packaging. Sometimes it's an exhibition. Um, we always start out with the kind of very nature of typography. For us, typography is not, um, is not just typesetting, but rather it's a kind of tool that has a lot of spirits as well as performative, you know, um, power in it. So um, here there's some, some, you know, um, typefaces that we design for um, different projects. And the other thing that also um, interests us is the kind of, um, the, is the ability, um, is graphic design's ability to actually deal with um, completely different scales, you know. So for us, you know, scale is really not an issue, but rather it's something that we play with, you know, um, in, in every aspect of our work. So you see that um, on the left here, um, it was a, uh, it was supposed to be an ad, you know, for this 25-story uh, um, LED building at Times Square. But um, what was interesting about the, 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 the site is that, first of all, it's in Times Square. So you can kind of imagine that the building is surrounded by just, you know, um, countless LED um, screens around it. But the building itself also is made up with these facets, you know, and that the, the facets somehow um, became this kind of very interesting canvas for the identity that we designed for this um, uh, for this art program. And on, on the right, um, it was a, uh, a pro bono project that we did for a startup um, in the Silicon Valley. So um, the 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 request was to design um, a, an, a home screen, okay, for um, a smartphone that we could do anything um, that we wanted and they would program it and they would put um, the, the app um, for sale um, on their platform. So what we did was that we looked at the most commonly used apps um, on a smartphone and then we created um, these modules, you know, in a way that they're, 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 they're kind of like Lego modules and each time you unlock your phone, um, these modules will become um, something else, like an object, you know. So we did um, a lot of these, and then we named it Transformer. And the other thing um, that, that, as I mentioned previously, that um, really interests us is um, the, 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 the very nature um, of identity and how an identity can actually perform um, in, very, in, in many different ways across different situations, across different um, media uh, platforms. So here um, is, it, it was an exhibition um, that we did for uh, Center of Architecture um, in New York. And um, it was an, um, a competition, an um, award. Um, so what we did was that we created this identity um, that is made with three um, converging lines, you know. So the, 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 the question was, how do we actually suggest, you know, architecture without getting all um, illustrative? And how can we actually create a kind of morphing identity 
that has its own particular um, presence, you know, when it's used statically, but it could also become windows or screens when it's used in digital interfaces. And then when it's deployed into physical environments, how it could actually become a kind of exhibition structure that held the content together. So on the right, you see that um, the the exhibition and also all the display type was made up with duct tape, you know, because um, we didn't have enough funding to actually do um, vinyl, vinyl type, you know. But that actually worked out uh, really well, you know. So it had this kind of really um, spontaneous kind of look and feel um, to it. And overall, I think that it held up the, the, the exhibition um, really well. So, you know, um, in summary, I think that what we ultimately deal with um, is the, the question of interface. You know, like for us, everything um, is an interface, you know, from, say, um, a, a coffee cup, you know, that that you um, get in the morning that has a logo on it to, um, say, a box of tissue paper or even to a building. Everything is an interface, and it's something that we kind of grapple with, you know, all the time. But... Um, in, in, in recent um, months, you know, I think that some of you uh, may have paid attention to this, what we call the kind of emerging um, technology, you know, specifically um, virtual reality. So, you know, um, the, the, the opportunity to actually interface with reality is kind of getting um, a lot newer now with these emerging um, tools. But then um, what's also interesting is that um, the, the, the idea or the pursuit of, you know, immersive reality um, isn't entirely new. Um, it really started out in the in the 60s, you know. Um, there were a couple of computer scientists and filmmakers started kind of tinkering with the idea of immersive um, reality from what you saw um, on the left, Sensorama, um, which was um, supposed to kind of provide five senses, you know, from um, not only the vision, but also the smell and the touch of things when you're actually viewing um, a, a piece of content. And then on the right, you see that um, the guy who's wearing something that looks like a pair of glasses, um, his name is um, Ivan Sutherland, and he actually invented the first, um, what we call immersive wearable, you know, just sort of like the president of um, augmented reality, sort of um, like, you know, Google Glass um, in a different way back in the day. And even something that's as analog um, as um, Viewmaster that we all play with when we were kids, there are kind of, you know, um, ideas to actually pursue a kind of different immersive reality. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the very real future of um, consumer technology, um, I think, will likely be experienced through a form of augmented reality. So what you're seeing here right now is a demo that, um, that Mark Zuckerberg gave um, when he was giving a demo um, for the virtual reality um, conference. So what's kind of crazy here is that... Um, the, the 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 person is actually taking um, a selfie um, inside a virtual reality uh, environment. I don't. I, I, I have a hard time imagining um, how it actually works. You know. Has any of you here, by the way, tried um, virtual reality at all? Raise your hand. Okay, great. Okay, so 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 you know what it's like, right? So you're kind of you know immersed in this infinite space where you can actually move pretty. Um, freely with limited um, field of view. So, you know, here um, a, a selfie is taken inside a virtual reality, and I guess that you could upload it onto Facebook, you know, later on. So that 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 is actually um, happening right now. But then, you know, if we look back to history, um, augmented reality actually has been a goal, you know, for mankind for a really, really long time. Um, it's just that right now we... We do it digitally, and then we also do it constantly, okay? So, you know, w without actually even realizing it, we're now actually living in a routinely in, uh, mediated uh, reality. We have already, I think, virtualized um, reality in a way that actually doesn't require any headset or any kind of, you know, um, wearables. We're actually doing it in our hands and our pockets, you know, that sort of reality that we're living in right now, which is also entirely virtual. But now going back to um, these new um, emerging 
uh, tools, you know. So I, I'm going to talk talk a little bit about the differences between some of these that are out there right now. So um, the majority of you here um, have tried uh, virtual reality, which you know is a kind of you know immersive um, box. Once you're in the box, you're completely disconnected from the physical world that you're in right now. So you're in a kind of fantasy land where you can kind of travel pretty freely. And um, the challenge right now for virtual reality is that um, it makes people sick, you know, it does. For example, I get sick within, I would say, five to 10 minutes, you know, um, inside virtual reality. Um, it makes me really nauseous. And that's something that the technology itself has not been able to kind of overcome um, as yet. And then there is um, another one um, that's called augmented reality. So augmented reality, again, has been something that's that's being um, that, that's in development, you know, for for decades right now. But I think that 2016 um, was a it, it was a really amazing year um, for for augmented reality because I think this is the first time that the world finally understood what it is through um, this um, mobile phone game called um, Pokemon Go. How many of you um, actually play that game or are still playing? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Don't be ashamed. One or two. Um, it's actually, it's actually, it, 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 it is a massively um, fun game. So um, how it works is that um, so there are these you know little monsters. They're the, the Pokemon clan, right? And um, your goal is to catch them. So you will try to find them, okay, at wherever you are. Um, with your phone. So you pull out your phone and you kind of just shoot your phone at the, at the environment um, you're at, be in school, be outside on the streets. Actually, a lot of people got into accidents because they got so into the game um, finding um, these Pokemon monsters. And once you find one that shows up on the screen, you would try to catch it, right? So these are, um, what, what I thought was re really interesting is that people um, started uploading or taking photos of these Pokemon monsters with their pets, you know, but in reality, these pets had no idea like what's going on. These monsters actually didn't exist, you know, in the physical world. But through the phone, through the kind of virtualized environment, these monsters were actually interacting um, with the pets. So augmented reality um, was 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 kind of uh, introduced, you know, um, as a wearable to the market um, a couple of years ago. Um, by Google through um, Google Glass. Um, any of you actually tried Google Glass at that time? Okay, no. Um, it failed actually, you know, uh, in, in the market. Um, it, it just didn't kind of live up to the um, to the customer exp expectation. It was also relatively um, expensive, and most of all, I think that it was really the first time um, when people were introduced the idea of wearing something that looks kind of weird, you know, on your face. But although it kind of failed um, in the market, but what it does was what it did was that it actually actually paved the groundwork for all the wearables that are actually emerging in the market right now. So you can see that, you know, um, all these um, celebrities wearing Google Glass, I mean, as ridiculous as they seem, they actually helped um, the, the, the public perception in terms of normalizing, okay, wearing something um, on your face. So that was augmented reality. So now look at this one, um, mixed reality. So um, you may ask, what's the, what's the difference between augmented reality and you know um, and, and mixed reality? Um, if the idea is to um, project virtual or digital content into the physical world, so what makes mixed reality very different from augmented is that mixed reality's content, the digital content, actually interacts and interlaces with the physical world. You know, meaning that. Um, there could be a, a, a panda um, walking up and down that table right now, you know. So that's the very idea of mixed reality, as illustrated here by Robert Downey Jr. in um, Iron Man. So you may ask, then he's not wearing anything. Well, right now um, you still have to um, wear something. You have to wear um, a pair of um, glasses, you know. That that. That's what we're kind of working on right now. So um, out of you know AR, uh, VR, and um, MR, 
um, combined, um, the, 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 the three combined together is actually a really, really huge um, market, you know. And because the market um, is really huge, as, as you can see here, they're very different um, projections. We actually gathered these numbers about a year and a half ago when we started working on this mixed reality project for Magic Leap, and I'm sure now the, 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 the numbers are probably more stabilized, you know, and probably um, gotten a lot of bigger. So, you know, this is a very huge um, market, so, you know, it, it's another reason that is not going to um, go away. So we think that, you know, the biggest market of the three is actually um, mixed reality. Um, why is that? Because mixed reality can actually um, cover nearly every aspect of life, work, and play, okay? It is really, really broad in its um, application. And um, my introduction to mixed reality was through um, this project and this company called um, Magic Leap. Magic Leap is a startup um, based in Florida, and they, um, um, they're creating a mixed reality um, platform and a device itself. So we began to uh, work with them um, in 2015, you know, in summer of uh, 2015, to kind of help them establish their brand identity and to try to actually figure out what, it, what is their soul, you know, of the company. Um, so you may say that, well, that was totally CG, right? It was. That little elephant was CG. But I want to, I want to pay attention to this, which was shot directly um, through the device. So it's incredible fidelity, and um, you may have noticed that the virtual uh, R2D2 and C3PO are um, really opaque. Okay, so um, that 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 is something that's very special um, to 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 Magic Leap. Um, they they have this technology um, that is very different from um, hologram, um, which is commonly used right now in mixed reality. They have this technology that they call the digital light field. So um, in a kind of very um, simple way, the way it works is very similar to how light um, works to our vision. So the, 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 the reason why we can see things um, is because there's light. Without light, um, the, the entire um, world will be completely black, you know, to our eyes. So Magic Leap managed to actually create um, light, you know, through um, digital means and um, projected backed into our eyes so that um, we could actually see these virtual um, content. So um, we, we were contacted by them um, in, you know, in summer 2015, and it was a, it was a pitch, you know, um, in, in branding term, um, a pitch is very similar to a competition. Um, so we, we, we had very, very little information um, about them because there was no um, product out there. There were a couple of um, articles, you know, written in um, tech blogs, very speculative um, articles, and there were um, a couple of, you know, um, videos about the um, the founder, the CEO, um, Roni Abovitz. And we kind of, you know, um, went in with pretty um, audacious, you know, assumptions um, and kind of more like very, very poetic, you know, um, in a way. And we weren't really kind of um, thinking about um, market or, you know, branding or how we're going to market um, this thing at all. But we kind of went in just kind of assuming what may happen in the very near future. Um, and what we knew um, was that one thing that we knew based on our research and the little information that it gave us is that um, mixed reality is very likely to kind of um, remove um, screens, you know, both in a kind of very literal sense and I think in a very conceptual sense. Um, so, you know, a screen has been the kind of 
dominant paradigm, paradigm through which we um, receive and inter interface with information. So if the idea of mixed reality is to actually put content into the physical world really freely, so we could assume that it's going to um, remove screens. But at the same time, it is going to leave us with a lot of complicated problems you know, to solve as well. Um, we, 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 got a, we got a project, you know, um, surprisingly, because um, we didn't have any practical um, proposals for them. But um, one thing that I do want to kind of point out a little bit is that um, we have been working with the um, CEO, who's also the founder, um, Roni Abovitz, you know. Um, Roni is a very, very smart and uh, eccentric um, man. He was trained as a biomechanical um, engineer, and he had a company that um, invented um, robots that would help um, doctors do knee surgery. Um, back in the day, he sold a company and he started um, Magic Leap. He is a musician. He plays in a band. Um, he is also um, a comic book um, artist. And this um, is a screen screen grab of a TED lecture that he gave. You know, he basically didn't say anything. He just got onto the stage in his astronaut suit, and there were these two furry. Um, things that were just jumping around um, behind him, and there was a band um, playing behind him. That was his entire um, TED Talk, and the audience went dead silence um, after he finished. So um, we, 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 we saw this, you know, um, before, uh, before we, we, we did the competition, you know. We, we kind of felt that, well, you know, there's a very artistic um, man here that um, also has a vision. So how do we actually um, work with this kind of mind, right? And we kind of um, assume that um, his mind actually sets the direction for the company, not just only the technology itself. So after we got the um, project, we kind of just looked at the very offering um, of the brand. So um, it, it, it is a very, I would say, strange um, combination of things that, again, it is something that we never saw before, okay? So typ typically when um, a company does hardware, for example, Apple, they do hardware 100%. Um, if you're a company that does content, you know, for example, Pixar um, is a content company, you do content 100%. And then if you actually do professional enterprise level stuff, that is your focus. But Magic Leap's business actually is made up with these three seemingly um, uh, different things, you know. So the, the the offering is very very strange, you know. Similar to a building that has very strange programming, you know. Think of it that way. So how do we actually make sense out of it, and how do we actually package it and structure it in a way that is actually um, friendly to um, general consumers? So we kind of. Um, just kind of organize our thoughts, you know, and propose these four areas that um, that that we wanted to help them with, you know. So the the the, the ask was very simple, you know. They needed branding, they needed um, brand architecture, they needed the identity, they needed um, some verbal development too, um, specifically naming the device. But we kind of broaden um, our work just by really looking at the nature um, of the problem. So we had to actually really deal with first. Of all, I think it's a perceptual and cultural um, challenge that's actually in the market right now. You know, it's a totally alien technology, and how do we actually um, communicate um, this thing to people, and how do we make people feel comfortable and safe about it? And then there is the whole narrative aspect of things. You know, how should we sound? You know, how, what, what what should we say, and what what do we actually talk about? And then there's also ling linguistic um, challenge, which is that. How do you actually um, deal with naming? Um, first of all, in a new computing platform that actually has a lot of things that um, perhaps didn't exist before. And lastly, there's a logo, there's the identity, there's the look and feel, and the whole palette of things. So um, we kind of looked at um, the, the, the perceptual challenge you know, um, at that time. I think that right now, um, the perception on virtual reality actually has softened a lot, you know. But at that time, th this was merely a year and a half ago. It was actually pretty unforgiving, you know. Um, so you see that on the left is just 
these pictures, you know, a, a bunch of people um, wearing um, Oculus with their mouth um, wide open, looking completely stupid. And then on the right, you see that um, this uh, cover of Oculus founder um, Palmer on Time, on Time magazine. And um, as soon as that cover came out, um, people started uh, to uh, make fun of him, you know, um, on the internet. You see that he was sitting on a toilet and then, you know, flying with pizza and all that. So um, the, 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 the market, you know, um, was really unforgiving, and, and which also signified that people are kind of very skeptical, right, um, about, about virtual reality and this kind of emerging technology in general. And I have to say that, you know, um, some really big um, tech giants aren't helping either, you know. So this was an image that uh, was shot a few months ago um, at the Samsung um, Gear uh, VR on Veal, and you know, here's uh, Mark Zuckerberg walking uh, past this army, you know, um, of, uh, of, of, of virtual reality um, people. So, you know, again, this kind of image, you know, can only create a lot of skepticism and also fear, and how do we actually um, overcome that? And then the other thing also um, in, 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 the, in the whole um, gamut of perceptual challenges that. Um, Currently, AR, VR, and MR is still kind of perceived as something that only gamers um, will want and need, okay? But what Magic Leap is trying to do also is to actually put out a device that ultimately should be conceived as a really high-end um, consumer electronic. As you can see from these two images, they actually don't go hand in hand, and they're actually contradicting um, one another. And how do we help them to actually resolve um, the big gap here? And that was one of the big challenges. And then, in addition to that, um, they already had a uh, logo, you know, that they, they, they were using already. And you see that there's this little guy that has two wings. It actually had a name. Um, his name is Leaper, okay? So we were told that um, the Leaper has really, really important symbolic value um, to the company um, and to, to Roni um, himself, too, that we actually shouldn't really mess with it, okay? So that, 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 that's something that we actually um, uh, t t took to heart, you know, pretty seriously. Um, and we did a little bit of research just on this mysterious um, leaper, and we did find out that um, it, had, it had a previous life um, before. It was conceived as some sort of, you know, um, intelligent creature, um, and we found that there were images of the crochet leaper, um, and it was also uh, designed as a kind of uh, robot, you know, that's like a Roomba, you know, um, the eyes are actually on top, you know, not on um, on the face. So we, we thought that, okay, so it is something that, that, that has some really important symbolic value um, to them. But again, you know, if we're actually um, going to convince um, people about that Magic Leap um, is a company that actually does um, cutting edge technology, I don't think um, these guys will actually tell that story, right, convincingly. So how do we actually deal with that? So as you can see right now, the problem is getting more and more complicated, right? So we have to kind of solve the um, the conundrum, you know, of the differences between gaming and um, high-end consumer um, product. And on top of that, we also have to deal with um, the leaper. Um, so where do we where do we begin? So uh, what we did first um, was that we kind of um, researched and kind of just outlined what we call this visual landscape. Um, so this is really zoomed out view. You, you cannot see the detail of it. So um, in the middle is basically uh, look and feel packaging visual from um, the gaming industry, okay? Be hardware companies or be um, content creation companies. So you see that the entire middle part gets really, really dark, right? Um, and then we also included um, companies that create a lot of um, entertaining content, in entertainment content, from say Pixar to um, Weta Studios, um, who is based in New, York, uh, New Zealand. Um, they did all the Lord of the Rings kind of CG content. So these are the areas that Magic Leap have to actually deal with, you know, because that's what they're doing um, as well. But um, what we kind of highlighted here also on the very far left is um, basically high-end consumer um, electronic brands. 
so all of a sudden you see a lot of white, right? You see a lot of minimalism. And that's a kind of look and feel that was really uh, kind of, uh, I think, put forth by Apple. And you see that many other brands are now following suit. And that's a kind of language that people are used to. So magically, we'll have to compete with that. But then um, on the far right of that spectrum is these, you know, um, very simplified, cute um, characters, you know, from Hello Kitty to um, Miffy. Um, and we think that, you know, the leaper actually comes from um, this world. So again, completely kind of jarring difference here between something that is high end, that is kind of defined by the Apple design language, and something that's entirely whimsical and playful. And these two are both magic leaps. So how do we reconcile these? So what we did was that um, we kind of, you know, helped them to realize that these are actually the two um, the two ends of the spectrum that they need to grapple with. You know, on the left side, we kind of characterize it as premium. You know, again, premium is is not the kind of design term um, that we would typically use, but it actually helps the marketing team and um, any other people who are not designers to kind of understand the direction that we're going. So there's the premiumness to it. And then on the right is actually playfulness, right? So these two, again, very different. So the first question is that, wow, can they actually leap, can, can actually live together, these two very different qualities? And then um, we said that, well, if we look at um, any technology brand, you know, currently and historically, can we actually name a brand that actually embodies these two qualities? And they said no. Well, exactly, and that's why we should do it, because we have a great opportunity to be the first one who experiment with this idea here. So, um, so you know, premium and playful. So we kind of use this image to just illustrate, you know, the point here. We, we see the two can actually live together and um, peacefully and um, beautifully. So um, there's a kind of sophistication that we really have to build in the brand, but we also need to keep the whole playful spirit, you know, of the company, which I think is really kind of guided by Roni, you know, um, him as a person. So the, the two qualities actually began to drive um, everything that we did. Um, first thing that we had to deal with is the um, verbal aspect of things. Um, we're writing, um, the about statements, we're writing mission statements, we're writing a lot of things, you know, for them just to kind of build the first um, communication um, tool and also to kind of set a model for what we have to do in the future. So here um, is the opening paragraph, you know, for the about statement. As you can see here, um, we're not trying to um, talk about technology at all. Why is that? Because technology, you know, um, especially this kind of new thing, can just be downright uh, terrifying. So what we want to do is really to help people to think beyond technology and to really think about the magical things that um, that this device can actually do for us. And then um, this is a, a, a an image that um, that was tweeted, you know, um, on their Twitter. Again, following the kind of example that we created. So you know, mixed reality actually the 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 idea and the thing itself um, is, is is the easiest, I think, to actually introduce um, to, to 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 people. Um, we're still doing a lot of work, you know, in that area right now. But I think that what's most difficult in the whole verbal um, development is actually the naming um, and the nomenclature, which I'm going to um, get into. So this kind of stuff is actually pretty easy to do, right? To actually create a story. That, um, that that engages um, people. So, as I said before, you know, um, we, we, we have to uh, name not only the device, but the entire um, operating system. So what do you name something that nobody's ever seen before, right? And do we really need to name um, or rename um, everything? So we have to really go back um, to, to, to history, you know. We have to look at, um, in, in computing specifically, personal computing, how things are actually named. So here you see that um, desktop, trash, document, folder, notepad, 
calendar window. These are these names were chosen um, very deliberately, um, and they're all based on the idea of an office, okay, a physical um, office. So as you can see here, that you know um, when when people are naming. Um, new technology, they typically go back to something that people already know to establish, first of all, a sense of comfort and a sense of familiarity here. So um, that's the kind of um, paradigm that we're in right now. Everything is centered around um, an office. So um, these are the icons that were first designed um, in the 1984 um, Macintosh, Macintosh um, user interface. So when they were um, training, um, first training users to kind of understand what these icons were supposed to mean, they, um, they, they inevitably wrote uh, a manual, you know. So the manual goes something like this. It says that, oh, this icon represents your file, okay? So they use the word represents, right? But then they, they, they very quickly found out that people, um, they basically removed the idea of representation immediately. They said, this icon is my file. My file is this icon. So they began to identify the kind of immediacy and the kind of familiar nature of the icon immediately. And that's something that we also um, have to grapple with when we're naming things um, in mixed reality. So um, we're naming um, a lot of things in the, in the, we're basically naming the entire operating um, system um, in addition to the device. And here you see that, um, Many names are actually um, blocked out just because um, they're, they're these new things that, you know, um, that I can't talk about um, right now. And you don't know what they are, and they're very exciting, and they're very weird. Um, so, uh, so, so magically right now, you know, is because they're actually introducing um, so many functions that never existed before. So in a way, they're actually messing with our reality, you know, because our reality is based on what we already know, right? So um, we're tasked to actually help people to, first of all, understand that the metaphors that they have grown up with um, are no longer um, sufficient when it comes to mixed reality. That's something that we have to communicate. But then, as I said, do we really have to um, rename everything, right? So when you rename something, it requires a learning curve. And we don't want people to go through unnecessarily unnecessary learning curve. So what we kind of... Uh, an example that we're using here is uh, it's actually taken from um, Star Wars. You know, um, everybody loves Star Wars, and we all know um, what a Wookiee is, right? So, so we have this kind of naming principle. It's what we call 102070. So let's start out from the far right. Galaxy. Galaxy is a name. It's a universal name. It's an existing name. It's a real word. Um, it is what it is, right? So we kind of identify that 70% of the stuff in the operating system kind of belongs to the galaxy. Um, we call it what it is kind of world, right? So by following this rule, people already know what these things are supposed to do. For example, you don't need to rename trash. A trash can is a trash can. And then there are those, they're sort of in the middle, you know, um, that, that we call we can put a spin on it. For example, lightsaber, right? It's a saber, but then there's something special, something kind of slightly different about it that we can actually put a suffix or a prefix to actually make it slightly different. And then there are 10% of things. They're truly, truly unique. They're truly um, one of a kind. And that's a that's an opportunity where we can kind of name it um, very creatively, such as Wookiee. So this is kind of um, teaching tool that we have to uh, establish not only um, for for the client themselves but also for ourselves, you know. And then the other thing, um, again, you see a lot of blocked out um, words here. Um, so another thing is that for everything that that is new, any utility or function or app that is new. We kind of had to create this uh, brief um, really for ourselves, you know. So here you see that on the top it says um, blank, AKA, blank, AKA. So these are all different words that are being um, used internally um, by the company and also by us to try to describe something, okay? So we had to write this, write this brief, first of all, 
uh, what is that thing, right? So something is the volumetric um, intelligent and situational something um, of the Magic Leap computing platform, right? And then this thing surrounds a user and snaps to the physical environment it is in. Sounds so weird, right? It's kind of really magical too. So what we have to do, first of all, is to really identify um, the thing that we're naming. And then we also have to uh, create a user case, you know, to really create a story based on the person and how this person may interact or interface with this new thing. So um, this actually took a lot of work and imagine that we actually have a cloud of things that we have to name. We also have to look at the relationship um, between these new things and to um, the existing um, app, but just being um, virtualized. So it's a quite, quite interesting and complicated um, naming process. And then the other thing, is, um, is screen itself, you know, as I mentioned before, we kind of anticipate that um, mixed reality will probably um, undo, if not remove, um, a lot of screens. So um, when we watch a movie or watch, for example, a TV show, you know, inside a mixed reality um, environment, you can just pull it out anywhere. It can go as large as your ceiling or you can snap it onto the wall. What do we call it, right? Um, do we want to rename it? Really? So that was a very big question um, from, from the client. Um, so what, what we propose is that, you know, just bypass the tool, you know, forget about the tool, just really focus on the good stuff, on the content. And we're already doing that now anyways. You know, you wouldn't say that I'm going to watch TV, right? But you'd rather say that I'm going to watch Netflix. So we're saying that just bypass screen. Don't even um, mention it. Avoid it. And it, it, it will happen um, very naturally. So that is all the work that we are doing. Um, we have done for the... Um, for the um, verbal part, and now there's the visual part. So there's still little little guy Leaper that we have to uh, work with, right? So the very first thing that we did was that we just kind of made it straight, and then we try to kind of understand it by um, any by a kind of geometrical, you know, or proportional construct, and there was actually none. That's all right. Um, so what we did was that we wanted to actually just make it first of all a lot more um, usable, meaning that it had these two really long wings, you know, which can get difficult when it's in application. So our starting point was really like utilitarian, but then also we just wanted to make it a lot um, nicer and cuter. So we kind of trimmed um, the wings, you know, and then still at the same time, we still remember that we couldn't really um, mess with the leaper. So, um, so that's all we did. And as you can see, we didn't do anything. Um, voila. But um, what kind of, um, kind of turn this leaper into a really playful but also, you know, more premium um, object is when we uh, begin to three-dimensionalize it. And then we, we did these three um, 3D renderings, you know, um, to kind of show um, that the leaper can actually look really, really sophisticated too, you know, but it's still the same um, leaper. And this one started to look a little bit like Darth Vader, um, so we didn't want that. And then... Um, we created this composition. Um, this is a to you know, it's a totally um, fake rendering here. But again, what we're trying to demonstrate is what um, premiumness and playfulness can look like when they're actually combined together. And I think that this image actually resonated um, a lot, you know, with them. They began to understand, oh yeah, you know, we can be um, this too. The two qualities actually they're not um, contradicting um, with each other. And then after that, we started working on the um, word mark, you know, the typography itself, which was, which was actually the easiest part um, in the whole project. So we kind of took the circular form that is in inspired by the leaper. We created um, the word mark um, from scratch. As you can see, there are a lot of pretty rigorous uh, angles here. Um, I cannot remember how we came out with these um, degrees here. But then, um, here we go. This was the kind of um, the, the, the very um, first sketch, you know. But what we want to do is that we want to kind of bring in a little bit of that leaper into the work mark itself without being illustrative. So we cut the, um, the, the, the bar um, at the bottom of the A so you get these pointed um, points. So that was done, right? So that was easy. 
Now, colors. So colors are always, um, the, I would say, the most difficult thing um, in, in branding because colors are really, really subjective. So our first idea is to actually bring um, the idea of light into um, our choice of color. So when you think about light, what is light? Light is RGB, right? But when RGB are combined together, it doesn't have any color. So in a way, um, light's color is colorless. So how about the white leaper? So we did that and this got rejected because um, Roni felt that it looked as if the blood has been drained out um, of the leaper. So okay, no white leaper. So what do we do here? So we actually did a lot of different color um, studies looking at various Pantone colors and none of them um, really resonated with them until one day um, we went back to the very idea of light, you know, and perhaps illumination uh, itself. And then we decided to actually use iridescent um, color. So iridescence is really not a singular color. It's actually a state um, of being, you know, it's a state of colors. It's always dynamic and it moves around and then it changes depending on um, uh, how you look at it. And we felt that, you know, it looks pretty cool too. And it also um, works really well with the idea of light. And then what's more magical about um, iridescence is that um, it already exists in the physical world. You know, there are plenty of um, swatches and ink and materials that are already iridescent. So we don't have to conform to one singular Pantone color, but rather it's the idea of it. And we felt that was pretty great too. So voila, so this was the leaper. Great, and everybody loved it. Um, so we did a, a couple of really quick tests just to show the kind of very dynamic nature um, of the leaper. And it always shows up in different colorations, you know, um, from the website to your Twitter. And this is another um, example here. Whoops. Uh, not working, that's okay. Um, of course, we have to put it um, in the Guggenheim, um, be physical or virtual. And then, as you can see, that you know, um, the, the the form of the leaper itself is actually a pretty useful um, form. It's just this you know little ball that can be big and small. And then, in um, in in terms of signage application, there are already films out there that we can use. That's really really convenient too. The only thing, though, that we actually really materialized uh, through this uh, iridescent um, color is their um, holiday card from last year. So here you see that we use this iridescent um, paper and we also wrote a copy. The copy was pretty easy, you know, but still um, playful and whimsical. It's basically all the things that we would do um, over holiday, okay? Eating, sleeping, a lot, a lot more eating. Um, so this was the first thing that we um, realized and one of very few things that we have materialized um, so far in addition to the stationery. Um, so this is the um, almost the last slide. So, um, so where do we go from here? And here I want to show you um, a, a video that's done by um, an artist based in Japan, um, Kaishi Matsuda. So this is a six minute uh, video. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. It basically tries to project the very near future um, when mix, mixed reality becomes ubiquitous. Okay, so it's a little bit frightening the way that, um, that it depicts our, uh, our, our reality here. Um, so you, you, you may say, is this really going to happen? Um, I don't know, you know, and I hope not. Um, the, 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 the total or hyper saturation of, of, of information is going to happen, I think, one way or the other. But I highly doubt that it's going to become um, this degree of um, insanity. But what's interesting um, in looking at this is that um, the interfaces where all the information is still treated as um, two-dimensional floating um, pieces. I think that that's not going to be true. Um, but you know, um, we don't know as yet how we're going to really deal with typography, for example, when it's actually always floating in space. When you actually look at it from the side, do you see um, its depth at all, or is it still a kind of floating piece? And how do we actually deal with branding or logos inside this um, completely virtualized um, environment is something that you know we're still um, working on right now. 
So um, getting a little bit away from the um, dystopian uh, virtual reality world, um, I just want to end my um, presentation with this. Um, they are my puppies, and um, I hope that they're not going to be virtualized, and I don't want them to be. Thank you. I, I kind of just wanted to ask um, initially, I remember mm. reading uh, an interview that you gave uh, I think it was with Design Boom, um, maybe a few years ago, and you said that uh, when you decided to study graphic design, you chose it because it was, uh, you thought at the time, the least technically challenging discipline. Yes. And I wonder, given the work that you're now doing, whether you still, uh, whether you still believe that. I'm sure you don't, because it seems like, you know, my interpretation of the presentation that you just gave was that um, your involvement with these companies is no longer, um, you know, th they have a product, they want to brand it, they come to you and the job is done. It seems like your role is now much more integrated within the design team uh, and that actually whilst they're thinking about the applications of the technology they have, your r role seems to be to think about the implications and the relationships that, you know, the people who use these things will, will develop. And I guess that probably does require quite a kind of in-depth knowledge of the technologies that they've actually developed. Absolutely. I mean, I have to say, you know, um, the sometimes I, I actually regret that um, I, I, I chose to, to study graphic design. Um, <laughs> at that time, it was seemingly the, the easiest thing uh, to do um, besides stu studying um, fine art, which is something that I wanted to do. Um, so I, I was I was asked by my parents to do something um, practical, and I was looking at these different departments, you know, from photography, um, which again involve a lot of technicality, to computer animation, which um, just the idea of using computer really frightened me at that time. Um, and then graphic design seemed something okay that required a little computer skill that you know I could mentally um, deal with at that time. So I did that. But um, it wasn't really until I think in the last few years as um, the complexity and the scale of our um, of our practice um, grew, I began to really understand the the the, the, the very complicated nature of our, of our practice because not only that we ultimately we have to um, produce um, something that is tangible and hopefully something that is good right um, that that we will be proud of but then at the same time we're dealing with a lot of I think organizational um, issues too you know um, internal politics and a lot of um, irrational likings and dislikings and I have to say identity design is really hard you know logo design is perhaps the hardest thing because you're dealing with so much perceptual issues that are actually completely out of your control you know somebody can hate something just because he had some sort of traumatic experience in the childhood with something and you know so mm -hmm. stuff like that or somebody can actually hate a typeface because the typeface name has something um, kooky about mm -hmm. it so these are really perceptual issues that we're, we're grappling with on a day-to-day -day, um, basis and that maybe is what makes it interesting too mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, it was interesting that you mentioned that um, you know, virtual reality has been around for what, 30 years or something. At least, yeah. Um, it started out in the six, more more in the 60s. Oh, so even yeah. longer. Yeah. And you know that at the time, I mean, maybe because the technology was limited, but it didn't take off. Um, Google Glass kind of failed for other reasons. I mean, do you, are these? Is that to do with the relationship people have with the things, or the you know, the, the the preparation? Uh, or the kind of the user isn't prepared in the way that they need to be to accept these these changes. It had to do. It had to do with the 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 stages of um, technological <laughs> development. So you know, the reason why we are um, open to say wearable to wearing a device on your face is because we're now currently in the stage of smartphones, right? So before smartphones, we had. Um, we had cell phones, and before cell f that we can, you know, the, the the flip phones, and before flip phones, we had um, desktop computers, and before desktop computers, there was the mainframe. So you really have to go through these technological development, you know, sort of 
similar to 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 um, to development of a civilization. So you you have to have these previous stages in order for this whatever stage that we're in um, mm -hmm. to to actually um, to become ubiquitous. You know. So I think that right now. Globally, we're really kind of at, um, we're reaching a saturation um, with smartphone right now, you know, and that's really um, an area that's now, you know, on the decline. So the question is that what is coming, you know, is virtual reality the answer? Um, maybe not, um, definitely not virtual reality because I don't think that, you know, the box itself can actually solve all the answer. Is it mixed reality? I don't know, perhaps, maybe. Can it actually replace all the screens? that we're using right now. Um, technologically speaking, it's highly possible, but will people want that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet, you know. So there are a lot of things that we don't know until um, the, 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 the stuff is being invented and being put into people's hands. Yeah. But I sort of understood from watching you go through your work that um, a big part of your role in that whole thing is, is is that mediation into the world so yeah google glass failed but that of course it could be part of the communication strategy around that yeah. and that, so a big responsibility that you have i would say almost in the world is is the the communication dissemination and acceptance of new technologies products and and the way that we that we exist in the world absolutely so, so in a way there's quite a burden of responsibility because the way that we develop our culture is being mediated through yeah. people yeah. like yourself. And I was just wondering if that's something that you discuss or engage with in, in your practice in terms of uh, how you, you mediate that, that communication, how you take on that responsibility. Well, we, 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 we question, I think, you know, um, <laughs> a lot of times we really question our, our moral uh, responsibility, yeah. believe it or not. Um, and I think especially... Um, you know, in like this year, I think 2016, you know, the, the later half of 2016 has been a really kind of um, uh, disastrous, but also I think awakening um, time for us. So we question that, you know, and especially right now, um, say with um, with Magic Leap, for example, you know, the very first question, even um, before we, um, we won the competition was that um, it, do we really believe um, what they claim, right? So, um, so there was a there, there is a very big um, principle. It's sort of like the ethos of the company is that um, they they wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't do any content, or they wouldn't allow developers to do any content that their moms wouldn't um, approve. So they have this mom <laughs> rule, you know, which is really Roni's um, rule. So um, it was actually written on their website um, before we actually started working on the project. So the question that we ask ourselves is that, do we really believe him at all, you know? Um, because we could actually imagine a lot of evil things that, um, that this device, um, this technology can do. So um, that was something that we just had to take a leap of faith, you know, to do that. So the kind of moral responsibility is really something that we question now. But I think that, you know, when it comes to carrying the, the, um, the weight of communicating um, a company's ethos and missions and what they do to consumers, to people. I think that's something that we can kind of deal with pretty comfortably, yeah. But I also sort of understood that that meant that you have to have an incredibly good read on people. It's sort of like, there's like a, a, an explicit cultural understanding to understand what the ethos of the company is versus what can be culturally digested. And I, I was wondering what kind of research goes into that or how... Is that intuitive? What, what's the process? It's, it, it's partially into like partially intuition, partially um, research. I think that I, I, I have a better um, antenna now, you know, uh, with with situations with people, um, and I can kind of determine the viability of things um, upfront, you know. But again, um, it really comes from a lot of failures, you know. Um, I had. Um, before Magic Leap, I actually worked on a um, virtual reality um, brand that got um, acquired by a very large social media platform. I'm, I'm not going to say the name. Um, I, so it was really exciting when we got the project. But eventually, 
guess what? I got fired, you know. Um, after five or six rounds of design, um, they were not happy. And then the news came out that they got acquired. And then they never really um, returned my phone calls or emails after that, you know. So that was a kind of painful um, experience. But now looking back, I think there were already signs um, there that I actually didn't catch, you know. So it's, uh, it's partial, you know, uh, intuition and now also part of a learning experience too. Because yeah. I, I want to know whether the um, the sort of methodology that you spoke about, um, you know, the the way that you kind of went back to how icons were described previously, uh, renamed <coughs> them, all the questions you asked, was that a methodology that you developed specifically for Magic Leap and and those kind of industries, or is that something that you apply to all sorts of? There, 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 there is a methodology when it comes to naming, and that methodology is applicable to um, all situations. But um, for Magic Leap, it is really, really, really unique and challenging in that um, we kind of had to really re-examine and reinvent our methodology. For example, um, really looking at the history um, of computing was something that we had never done before, but we, we realized that, you know, without doing that, we're not going to be able to kind of understand the material that we have in hand. You know, for example, um, the game, um, what is that bird game? Uh, the Angry Birds, you know. So, for example, there, 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 there's the game Angry Birds, and then you can play Angry Birds on your phone. We know that. You can probably play Angry Birds on your screen with PlayStation. We know that. But what do you call Angry Birds in mixed reality? What do you call Angry Birds in Magic Leap, right? Is, are they still the same Angry Birds? And how do we actually call them, right? So we, we, we kind of run into these, these very weird um, questions, you know, and also the idea of desktop, you know. Like, like in, in, in the current world, you know, you can easily distinguish what is an operating system and what is a desktop. But for us, you know, we actually, like, grapple with that question for at least three weeks. We couldn't just, we couldn't figure out what is what and what actually distinguished the two. And that is really interesting. And that kind of situation really required us to kind of reinvent um, our, our methodology. I thought that process around nomenclature was really interesting and the idea of language being so important in, in understanding something. But I, I was wondering what happens across cultures with that nomenclature. Does it just get tra translated into Japanese, Chinese, uh, Arabic? No, no. <laughs> um, we, have to, we have to do linguistic check um, across pretty much... Um, there's, a, there's a number of um, most spoken languages that we have to check. Uh, one by one, um, first of all. Um, and also, um, uh, we have not actually checked the things that we're naming right now in the operating system. Um, most of them actually are re real world um, names that um, we already checked would, would not have any problem, but still it requires like a legal person to do that. But when it comes to say the device name itself, you know, um, you, you, you can just translate a name from, lang from one language to another, or even like the brand name itself, Magic Leap, you know, you cannot just take these two words as is and translate that into, say, Chinese, you know. So we have to, again, really looking at um, the poetic quality and the lingu linguistic construct of these words and names and try to create something similar in other languages. For example, like I am naming. Um, the, 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 the brand name um, in Chinese, for example. So, and how do I actually present, you know, um, a Chinese name to an English-speaking um, client? So there's a lot of actually language education that I have to set forth um, up front. You know, you have to first understand how Chinese works, right? So um, to actually create that is a kind of creating a curriculum, you know, which um, we, we love to do. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you, what, it's is, really like, what is the Chinese name? I cannot tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, have, we have some options. We have some pretty good options, you know. But um, but we we created so much kind of teaching and learning materials, you know, both for ourselves and for them. And I think that that part is really kind of the the the, the super interesting part, you know. That um, I don't know where it will go, you know. Say after the product is launched. 
after um, this is really like normalized out there in the market. I don't know what to do with that um, material as yet, but I think that this kind of added value that we're getting to. So, so with that sort of new technology, are you finding that you're having to work in new ways? Sorry? With the, new, the kind of new territory that this technology takes you into, are you having to develop new ways of working? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and we're really we're we're, we're really agile, you know, in that way. Um, like I said, my team is pretty small, and um, we can experiment things um, really quickly. And we do have failures, you know, things that just don't work, and we can actually see um, very quickly, you know, um, be names or how we name things, the criteria that we establish or how we actually design, for example, um, we can do that pretty quickly and easily and that's a benefit that we have, you know, at, Pen at Pentagram. Have you formulated more questions there or should we I have, I have one more actually. <laughs> um, I, one of my favourite slides was your one with the kind of the Game Boys and everything, all the things that, um, you know, might be replaced as a result of this technology and that kind of... Uh, I guess tied into something that I'm personally interested in at the moment, which is uh, kind of Nick Bostrom's uh, simulation hypothesis, the idea that we might all actually be living within a computer simulation. And it seems like with things like Magic Leap, where you know, these images are now kind of leaving the screen and becoming kind of semi-physical, um, that kind of sense that everything can be simulated seems kind of more and more believable. And... Um, and I think that you know that it's led people to write about uh, you know this point in time, the simulation singularity, where reality and virtual is indistinguishable from each other. Um, but that point will come uh, when the technology becomes high resolution enough to be believable. But also when we get used to real world becoming lower resolution. And I guess I, d I wonder whether um, that's something that you considered whether actually the work that you're doing is going to disrupt um, all the, time. the rest of your all, work. All, all <laughs> the time, you know. Um, first of all, um, I, 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 I'd rather believe that I'm not a simulation here. <laughs> um, that's the first thing. But um, one, one very big question that, that we grapple with is that when the virtual content the digital and virtualized content is so sophisticated to the point that it's no longer distinguishable from the actual physical thing. What do we, how do we, do, do, do we need mm -hmm. that separation, right? So in design, what, first of all, that's the first question. Do we actually need that? And secondly, if we do, what do we call or how do we actually frame this virtual thing? One big question that we had was that, for example, in mixed reality, if um, everything is so real, right, um, I can give you a cat, okay? So um, I'm going to give you a cat. So, But do I actually call that cat a cat or I'm actually, do I call it a virtual cat? Mm. Right, like Tom, I'm gonna give you a virtual cat, or I'm just gonna give you a cat. Right, so so that itself is, is such a stupid question, but that is a very fundamental um, question that we need to answer, really, as designer. I think that as as these companies too, and I think that these are the questions that they're also trying to answer because they have to frame it mm -hmm. in a way um, that, first of all, um, I mean, it, it is going to disrupt a lot of things, but they have to frame it in a way that I think is ultimately healthy for the mind, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's something that, we, that we're that we trying to answer, yeah. too. Yeah. Do people have questions? Sorry, I can't see anyone. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. It was really good. Um, I was just wondering, so you, throughout, you um, described how, um, like, this uh, mixed reality or virtual reality is going to lead to um, a kind of death of the screen. Um, and I kind of was thinking about how, like, in a way, the emergence of the screen tapped into an inner kind of human narcissism. So, like, the kind of the rise of the selfie and um, 
those kinds of things. And I just wondered whether, I, I guess I was kind of questioning whether that death of the screen was specific to the Magic Leap project or whether um, uh, you really think that we will actually kind of lose these interfaces that allow us to kind of project ourselves within a, like the present um, time and also a kind of virtual time of social media as well. I don't, I don't think screens are, are going to die. Um, I think screens will be gradually uh, disappearing or you know getting less and less um, from, from our world. I think that, that that is already happening. I think that we're at, at a kind of saturation point right now, you know, given that um, smartphones are so ubiquitous, right? Um, but you already see that um, in movies, you know. Um, Minority Report, for example, which is a film that was made, I think, about 10 years ago, or maybe a bit longer than that, um, in, in, you know, with Tom Cruise. Um, in the movie, everything, like all the interfaces are basically virtual. There was no screen. You can pull out anything. Um, or in Iron Man, for example, you know. Um, so, so I think that um, the kind of um, screen, I wouldn't say screenless situation, but I think there will be less screen situation. I think that's already happening and that will happen pretty rapidly. I think once mixed reality actually becomes um, user friendly, you know, I don't know whether, I, I don't know when that state will happen because there's still a lot of challenges with the, with the tool, you know, itself that is it, is it comfortable enough? Um, is it nice looking enough? You know, these are a lot of questions that, that, that are actually engineering and aesthetic questions that I don't think will be solved pretty quickly. But once I think they get through that hurdle, the kind of screen less condition will happen pretty quickly. Disappearance of the screen, because I mean, like things like um, Minority Report and movies and things. Number one, you're kind of seeing that through a screen, like in in, in its own right. So um, I just think that we can't necessarily reference sci-fi films to kind of make that. Well, that's because you haven't actually uh, experienced Magic Leap, <laughs> and I have. Okay, okay. <laughs> I have seen some really cool things, yes. <laughs> um, thank you very much for an incredible um, presentation. I, I want to go back to one slide, a, a different slide maybe, which is the slide of the, um, the psilocybin, the opium, and the, the coca leaf, which you showed, and, and you were talking about, you made an incredible comment, which I thought was very powerful, which, you, which was that um, we've already virtualized our reality. Yeah. So. So if you imagine like a mixed reality is supposed to be like one bit which is really real and then another bit which is augmented or virtual, yeah. Um, and as soon as, you, as soon as you put in place the virtual bit, and I think this is basically what Tom was saying before, right, you, you change the way we, we see the real bit, yeah. So the real bit com becomes less real somehow um, as the other bit, bit becomes more real. So they, they, they shift each other. So, so I wonder... Um, when and then there was there was another point that you made, which is if you were talking about um, moving away from the desktop and the way that this thing would somehow read your environment and then snap onto your environment. So actually, what it's doing is somehow using the environment as an interface. Yeah. So how do you think um, physical space, or how would you imagine, or have you speculated about the way that physical space would shift with this kind of virtual layer? You know, would it start to adapt in order to accommodate the virtual layer in a new way? What happens? What happens to like r real architecture versus virtual architecture once these, you know, um, new paradigms come into place? Hmm. I never thought about that question, and that's a pretty terrifying question. If you think about that, you know, right now, um, the the virtual content has to conform to the given physical content, you know, given that, okay, say there's a panda here, but the panda can only run between that wall and this wall, right? That's, that's how it works right now. But if we begin to kind of imagine 
that the force is actually going the other way um, around, meaning that physical architecture has to be reimagined and we're, you know, um, <coughs> approach completely differently to accommodate some sort of new conditions from the from the virtual reality. I think that's a that that's an interesting thing and that's highly um, possible, you know, and what's what's yeah, would you would you design a, a building differently? Um, you may have anticipating to. the fact that it's going to have all of these other things sitting right. on top of it later. Right. You, you may have to, um, especially now. No, I mean, knowing and you know, having experienced the the kind of um, scaleless nature of um, virtual content, meaning that you know, the panda can actually run between here and there, right? But then the panda can actually all of a sudden grow, you know, as tall as the Empire State Building, if you like. Um, so there's that kind of incredible, kind of uncontrollable, fluid nature to digital content. And that may, you know, um, influence how um, architecture um, is approached, you know. And I think a lot of old paradigms, you know, things that we already know um, will, 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 will be challenged, you know. For example, you know, um, the auditorium itself, you know, this kind of set up a stage, audience, you know, um, projection screen, or just, you know, screen. Um, the screen nature itself may have to change, yeah. And, and have you guys given thought to, to like, also, how, how important is it to distinguish between the virtual part and the real part? Like, are there safety things or, or legal things or, you know, like, you know, what what is, I mean, Tom's example of, like, when when the when the projection becomes so real that you can't distinguish it from something that's really real. Um, that, that's kind of it's amazing and fascinating, but it's also, y you can imagine, raises all kinds of really tough questions as well. Absolutely. Well. Um, we, we, we first, you know, uh, this is still a really new topic for us, and our, our position on it kind of shifted um, back and forth a little bit, I have to, I have to be honest. Um, so when we when we first started thinking about you know um, the distinction between virtual and the real, um, our position was that if the virtual could be so real, why do we need to call it virtual, right? You know, what, because that 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 is actually another layer, another um, communication layer that is there. So we might as well just remove it. And that was a kind of I think very impulsive. Um, graphic designer or branding person's thought is to really kind of, you know, make things a lot more um, efficient, you know, um, to reduce the layers as much as possible. But then, you know, um, the, the, the question is that, right, if we're actually no longer distinguishing um, the two, is, is, is that even healthy, you know, um, to our mind? Um, I don't know if you guys watched... Um, this net Netflix series called Black Mirrors. Um, so there's one episode that's basically about this this very um, issue is that the virtual and the physical are basically blended, entirely blended together. And the person eventually went crazy. Um, so so yes, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I think that right now, after shifting back and forth on this topic, you know, I think that there has to be uh, distinction between yeah. the two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a, it, it must be the most interesting space to be working in as a as a designer, a graphic designer, because all of the conventions for how you describe those things just don't exist. So yes, and then the other th the the other thing that um, that I didn't really show or talk about today is is the very idea of you know representation of ourselves. You know, so right now. Um, you you could probably make an avatar um, out of yourself, and when we say avatar, you you know what it stands for, you know what it means. But then, if the representation of yourself, um, meaning Natasha here, that could just be as real as the actual Natasha here, and that could actually just go anywhere or show up anywhere. What do we call that, and you know, how do we actually, how do, how do we really deal with that conceptually, you know? And that I think um, will happen, you know. It's just a matter of time. Is the the idea of representation? Yeah. Are there more questions out there? Okay. 
Thank you for tonight's lecture. Um, one thing I wanted to ask uh, is in terms of the target group of the project. Uh, these kind of technologies have uh, quite vast and ambiguous audience. Uh, so uh, would it be aimed towards family entertainment or is it uh, more of a professional tool? Uh, all of did them. You, uh, I would okay. say all of them. Again, I think that the, 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 the barrier of the tool itself, you know, has to be somewhat dissolved first. There's still a big barrier, right? Um, that is in the tool, in the device itself, you know, um, in, in across all different um, virtual, augmented, mixed reality tools right now. That has to be dissolved um, first. But then, you know, once it's dissolved, um, the applications are basically boundless. You know, you can use it in the professional field, you know, in, in medical training, for example, or even um, in military training. And you can think about the, 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 the potential um, educational um, possibilities with this and entertaining, you know, entertainment, um, watching films, playing games, all of it. Um, and also imagine how this will actually um, change uh, retail or how we, how we shop, you know. I mean, that itself is a very, very big um, concern, I think, you know, for us too right now and how advertising works, you know, if you're already bombarded by all the Google ads, you know, um, in whatever websites you look at, you know, when you when you Google, just imagine how advertising may may work um, when it's always there with you. Are there discussions around the regulation of that sort of thing? No. <laughs> No, the the I mean we're 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 in a world right now where um, regulations, where you know, legal development is just so behind technology development. Um, not just in, not not just within um, the you know virtual reality, but also like with everything right now. And so then, um, with a company like Magic Leap, that uh, they they don't want to develop anything that their, they mother, have, their they mother wouldn't want to see. They have they um, have a, <laughs> a, they they have a very strong sense of morality. You know right. that that I know um, pretty well. You know after um, having worked with them for 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 you know so long, um, I know that 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 is something that they really care about. But then you know. Um, Inside, for example, virtual reality, you know, the black box, the first thing that people would do is pornography, right? Um, and that's already um, happening. So what is the company's policy um, on that? You know, um, that is really up to, to the company, to the brand right now. There are no regulations. Yeah. Are there more questions out there? Uh, Really, really quickly, just following on from what the gentleman said there. Natasha, could you see yourself buying one of these and using it for the work that you do? Can I do could, what? Could you see yourself buying um, one of the um, Magic Leap sets and using it for the work that you do? I can't wait for it to come. <laughs> yeah. Um kind of to go well, to go back to what I was saying before but also to follow on from that point um, in the film Her uh, the man falls in love with his phone and um, I think that the device and the physical thing has provided a source of comfort and kind of like um, especially in the kind of atomized way that we live now um, I was just wondering whether you could describe how the experiences you felt when you've been using uh, Magic Leap and whether it felt like maybe, I don't know, a weight off your shoulders and how it feels to not actually have a physical thing kind of like kind of tied to your body and mm. yourself. Mm, it was um, magic, really was, you know. Um, very, very, very new and um, alien and strange, but in a in a very magical way um, too. But um, what I was what I was using um, the the tool itself is actually a demo um, tool, which is what you know what they're still using right now. So it's a pretty heavy thing and pretty big too. So um, I I did not try 
the actual um, device, you know. But uh, imagine just seeing um, a whale, you know, um, flying um, above you, and um, imagine hummingbirds, you know, going around you, and um, you can touch them with your fingers, but you're not really touching them, but, you know, they're playing with you. Um, that's the kind of experience that I had, and um, I can immediately, you know, I could immediately imagine that this um, this this thing could to be put into practical use pretty pretty fast, you know. Um, yeah, browsing the internet, easy. Um, I came across a product that was, um, it was a virtual, re well, uh, a AR um, way to see your unborn child. Um, mm -hmm. So you could put on the thing and you could meet the baby before it was born. Why um, would people want that? <laughs> sorry? <laughs> Why would people want to do that? I don't know, but there's like, there's, I guess there's situations like that that do, st that are quite strange and that kind of come about with the idea of like kind of maybe going into bodies as well as going to mm. I mean out of space mm. or something mm. like that mm. I just wondered whether you kind of have thoughts on the again maybe moral thing or um, um well you know the the thing about virtual is that it can go anywhere and it can be anything um it's already happening um, right now, you know, um, to your example, somebody could actually imagine this unborn baby or, you know, to, to detect what the baby may look like and virtualize it and give it a kind of physical face so that you could see it. That, 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 that will happen um, no matter what. Um, but, you know, it's not something that I would like to, um, to, to, to experience. I think that, you know, the, the, kind of, um, the kind of beautiful thing about um, where we are right now and um, kind of how we, how we live right now is that there's still surprises that I think happen, you know, um, in the physical world, the kind of very, um, I would say, um, kind of serendipity moments that would still happen. But I think that, you know, if, if virtual um, technology is so powerful, that it may just take away a lot of these surprising um, moments that we encounter as just normal human beings. And I think those parts are still pretty important to retain. Uh, oh. um, I was thinking about the, the, the presentation about, uh, there was a one page about the, with digital light waves where you can produce vision on your brain and mind. So I can feel like, um, is this kind of like virtual reality more like stimulate our brain, only our brain and we can feel with our five senses like as, as, it, as to, to make us believe that it is reality or something like that. So uh, if this, I can feel that if it's like that, maybe we don't need to use our physical body. Maybe we we only need to like work on our brains only. So who knows? I, I was wondering what what <laughs> you have experienced in those kind of magic lip, and then I was feeling if you are having something heavy and uh, it's like. Could it well, be like just a st stimulation on your brain? Or? Well, um, all of it is stimulation, you know. Even like right now, this very moment, um, when I'm talking, I'm actually giving giving your brain a kind of stimulation, right? You know, but through a kind of very different means, uh, mediated very differently, and it all just comes down to these different ways of um, experiences and content being mediated differently, right? So you say that um, the light field, digital light field is a way that, is a thing that projects into your brain to actually stimulate your brain. But then, you know, it's just a different way of seeing, you know, and I'm not saying that it, it is a good thing or it's, is, is good or bad, you know, it does actually work a lot better with your body because um, you're still in the actual um, environment, you know, as opposed to say, 
um, inside a virtual reality um, device, you're completely disconnected. And then that, that itself actually, it does create a lot of physical discomfort, you know. So comfort itself, I think, is there, you know, given this technology. But again, you know, um, I'm not from the medical field that, you know, I don't know um, the long term implication of using this on, on, on a human body. I don't know yet. And I think that is still something that yet to be um, studied. On all these different devices, we don't know yet, you know. And even, like, we're still speculating um, whether um, the light from from our smartphone is um, messing up with our brain, you know, and sleeping pattern. And there are actually more and more studies that just that just um, come out, you know, um, relatively recently. But when was smartphone um, invented? 2007. You know, that's about um, nine years ago. So it actually took 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 um, researchers and you know specialists a while to come up with these things to to understand these things. I'm conscious of the fact that we're sort of bombarding you with questions about the technology itself, but actually that's not your responsibility in the project. I think it's just born out of extreme curiosity for our future. But um, I, w I was sort of wondering what you see your role as in sort of bringing this new technology to the world, because you're now sort of embedded in a team that is it's taking us to new territory. So I was wondering what you see your role as in that. Mm. I have, I've got a question as well that's sort of related to that. <laughs> I was going to ask, the... The uh, Leaper, you showed some examples of how it might be a light, a pendant, something like that. Is this the first logo or kind of icon that's actually, rather than just, I mean, it, it's always said we have relationships with brands. Is this the first relationship with a brand where every one of us has a different relationship with it because it's artificially intelligent? Um. Well, how do you know it's artificially intelligent? I, don't know, I guess that's my question. It may well. not. It, it may <laughs> not live in the um, in the mixed reality environment. You know, it may not uh, come out and fly around. It may not. It may just be a static logo, um, like a portrait. You know, on the box, on the packaging. Um, we don't know yet. You know, but it, it, its previous life um, was an, an intelligent um, and friendly, you know, um, creature. Um, we don't know yet, and that's a question that we were still uh, debating um, about. Um, because ultimately, you would, once you're in the environment, you would definitely have to have um, a helper, you know, um, similar, say, to uh, to Siri or to um, God. They're all women's names. Like, what do you call the one that Microsoft um, has? Cortana, you know, um, so so you would definitely have some sort of um, helper. So, um, who's that helper? Um, is it a man or is it a woman? Is it the leaper? Do we want the leaper to live that way? Um, we don't know yet. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So going back to my <laughs> question, <laughs> um, to be related. yeah, no. <laughs> what do you see your role as in in this whole kind of? Exp uh, you know, my technological leap. actually, I think my my role for the for 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 this project and my role for um, for, for for the people, you know, for consumers um, out there is is actually no different from my role for any other um, projects. You know, um, we what we do ultimately is to actually help people access or experience the content in a more enjoyable way. You know, I think that's sort of bottom, bottom line of it, but also add <coughs> our intelligence into it. Um, Magic Leap is special because it's an emerging and it's a new and p potentially disruptive um, technology. But if you think about the kind of scaleless nature um, of brands, you know, and um, sometimes the destructive nature um, of brands, you know, um, they're no different whether it's an analog brand or it's a um, digital brand. And um, it's sort of our own moral standard that I think is the bottom line here. Yeah. Are there more questions out there? Or? All right. Someone Somebody? Oh, sorry, Marcus. So you, as you quite rightly said earlier, you know, technology moves us, but it also takes us. 
Thank you. In terms of things like governance and legislation, like if you look at things like Moore's Law and the exponential nature of technology um, advancing at such a high rate, um, I guess what my question would be is that um, this Magic Leap thing sounds incredible and, as you said, you've tried it and the limits seem boundless and so when it does come out, it could have a really profound effect on society. Um, technology and society as, as a whole are kind of really inherently linked to each other. How do you see um, your role as, or not necessarily your role, but the kind of marketing role of producing this thing to the consumer? How, I mean, as, as you said, say Google Glass failed because it was slightly maybe overpriced and didn't really function in the way it should have done. Um, and so it didn't kind of appeal to everyone. But if this thing is um, marketed in the right way and appeals to the right people, you could arguably sell it for a very high price. And then when that price is set, that kind of automatically rules out a fair mm -hmm. part of society. How do you prevent a, a situation whereby some parts of society are then given this limitless, boundless um, technology, which they could then further a certain area and other people are left to not participate you know that that is entirely out of our control um, as, as as a as a designer and as a you know branding um, person because um, there are just too many factors that are in play there right now that um, we we don't even have any knowledge um, of you know for example how how do these prices come about um, I have very little idea. I have a general sense about the price range, and I have a general sense about um, the the very preliminary reasoning for that range from a marketing or um, competitiveness point of view. But exactly how these pricing come about, I have no idea. Um, and I have to emphasize on one thing, that is um, branding and marketing, yes, can help. Um, you know, um, any product to 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 become popular, or first of all to be accepted, and then to potentially become popular. But branding cannot actually invent the product itself, meaning the offering itself has to be there. Um, you know, Apple's success, for example, wasn't just its beautiful design and branding. Apple's success was that um, they they completely reimagined and invented a new computing platform. You know, Steve Jobs had this quote, you know, he said that his goal in life is to put a dent in the universe. Um, so that really set out what Apple was as a company. Um, and yeah, with smartphones, I can say, yes, um, they, did, they, they, they did it, you know, for better or worse. Um, that is something that, that that's not branding can actually do um, or marketing. Um, so you were saying that you were trying to combine um, what you were calling playful and premium, right? Um, which at the moment are probably targeting completely different consumers. So who are you trying to target? Which consumer is your target if it's a com combination of playful and premium? Ultimately, everyone. I mean, who wouldn't want something that's premium and playful at the same time, <laughs> right? I mean, put pricing um, limits aside. If this thing was $5, you know, and it could actually do all these amazing things for you, would you buy it? Probably yes, right? Um, so it's really the pricing barrier that's there. So what we're trying to trying to really do also um, is that, again, we, we're, we're not there to actually invent certain qualities, you know, to invent fictions um, for a company. The, the the, the playfulness is, is essential to the very existence and being of Magic Leap. Um, it's a super playful group of people. Um, premiumness is actually design and also how they um, go about design everything they do. Okay, that's something that, that, that could be learned and okay, we introduced that, but I have to say we didn't invent anything um, for them and these are qualities that I think everybody would like, universally speaking on the planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, the, the questions continue. <laughs> I'm wondering what we have in terms of time. Are we all right of time? There's also the group afterwards and the last group. Yeah. 
So maybe we should take our last question and head out to the lobby <laughs> for some alcohol. <laughs> I have to say, I design books too. Okay, yeah. I don't. I don't just design <laughs> for <laughs> it's for a just reality. Reality. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hi there. Um, it seems like uh, initially what I thought about what you do before I came to this lecture was quite a linear process about how you'd receive a brief from a client and then you'd produce something and it would come out. But actually, having heard you speak, you seem so integrated in the design process. I wonder if you've actually ever changed the perceptions of the people you work for about their own business? All the time. We have to. Um, so we, 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 we rarely kind of just conform to a brief. You know, Of course, we ask clients to provide um, as much information as possible. Sometimes it comes in the form of a really well-written 20-page brief. Um, sometimes it comes in the form of two sentences. Sometimes it comes in form with, you know, uh, with a bunch of like statistics, for example. Um, but what we do is that we always try to redefine the very brief of a project, always, you know, regardless of um, the nature, the medium, the scale. Um, and um, we, we succeed most of the time, yeah. How about we go and have a drink out in the lobby? Natasha, thank you very, very much. Thank for your you. Time. <laughs>